Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, folks. It's the fishing show where size matters. My name is Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is the lovely and talented Nathan Benson. For this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, we're talking about big bass baits and arguably the best big bass lure ever. It's a bait that was developed nearly 80 years ago and is still made today. Actually, I think it's uh, yeah, it's I think a it's like, over. Yeah, it's like it's, it's over eighty. It's yeah, close to eighty five. And, and you know, this bait hasn't only accounted for maybe the most record bass, state record bass, uh, contest record bass, and stuff like that. But it's also played a huge part in a lot of anglers' very first bass. Yep. And uh, rather than keep you in a whole lot of suspense, the first thing I want to tell you is a little hint, uh, and that hint is Fred Arbogast. And if that hint doesn't make lights flash in your head, you were most likely born after 1990. Uh, Ken, tell the audience the bait we're going to discuss tonight. I can do that. The bait is, of course, the Arbogast Musky Jitterbug. And uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm, uh, no, really, please stop applauding and, and sit down. Take your seats. The Musky Jitterbug does deserve a standing ovation. Uh, but you know what? A lot of folks... I bet I bet a lot of you don't know what we're talking about. The yeah. jitterbug. Uh, that's that beta has been, maybe you're thinking. Uh, and, and you're right, of course, it's been around a long time. But you need to hear about how many big fish this bait has caught in its nearly 80 year life. Yeah, absolutely. I it it, it was developed, first come out. It, actually, at the beginning, it was built by a concept that Fred Arbogast had and put in his drawer in the, in the mid 1920s. And it wasn't for a guy by the last name of Ortel uh, that was digging through Arbogast drawers. Uh, why that would be. Uh, I don't like the way you said that Terry digging, yeah, through, <laughs> digging through his drawers. That. Yeah, exactly. But, but Ortel's digging through Fred Arbogast drawers and comes out with this bait and says, what is it? And Arbogast says, Oh, it's a, was a bait that I designed uh, to run under the water to mimic a shad, and you got go ahead. Well, I was going to say let let's stop for a moment because um, <laughs> even if you are relatively new to the sport or, or young, you've probably heard the name Arbogast, and mm -hmm. like a lot of the names you hear in the world of bass fishing, whether it's Norman or Cordell or Smithwick or all those names, um, this is a real human being. Uh, Frederick Allen Arbogast was born in 1894 in Akron, Ohio, and uh, he was a lure designer and a manufacturer and one of the all-time great lure designers and manufacturers. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also a, a world-class and record-setting caster. Yep. Uh, whether you're talking about a bait caster or a fly caster, this guy was one of the best in the world world at it setting distance records that would blow your mind today yeah. uh in 1926 he created the fred arbogast company in akron ohio and in addition to the jitterbug which we're going to talk about in this episode he also designed a couple of baits called the hawaiian wiggler and the hula popper and those are probably the biggest sellers that the arbogast company ever had uh fred died in 1947 he was only 53 years old he had a heart condition and uh, he died while ice skating in an ice yep. skating rink in akron ohio and ironically two years to the day before he died of a heart attack while ice skating he had collapsed at his desk and that was the first indication he had a um a heart no condition unfortunately he didn't live very long but he made a massive impact on our sport and if you're like me and you like to pay your respects to these legends of the game uh, Fred is buried at Spring Grove Cemetery in Medina, Ohio. So that's Fred Arbogast. I, Terry, I always think we got to know the people behind these stories. Yeah, and, and he's one that uh, that you, if you're a bass nut, you've really got to know him because his his legacy still lives today. You know, the, the hula popper is still made, the jitterbug is still made um, under, of course, Pradco, uh, and and. There are two baits that, that have probably accounted for more first bass than any other baits combined. It's uh, just right up there. What, 
what he what he's designed over you know his his life um but the jitterbug didn't start out as the jitterbug it, it his concept was to de develop a bait that would you know run under the surface maybe a foot or two uh the lip that he had on it originally was the same lip rough roughly the same lip that is on it today it's just that it was flipped opposite it, the the cupped oh. end wasn't faced forward the cupped end was faced back and uh that is actually a musky wooden musky jitterbug when they came back out with the musky jitterbugs in about 1989 right ken that's exactly right terry yeah i have some i have some friends at pradco who yeah so that's one. so they they stopped making them out of wood um I can't remember the exact year, but we have someone that's going to be coming on here that's probably going to remember the exact year. Uh, they quit making them out of wood, went to plastic, uh, and then for about a year or two in the late '80s, they brought back the wood uh, as a, a, a special, you know, anniversary issue or something like that. I think it was the 50th year, and uh, so the bait, you know, the 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 bill is aimed backwards and this guy by the name of Ortel looks at it and they start him and Arbogast start fiddling with it and they flip the bill back around so the cupped end is facing forward they go out and and test it and they look at each other and, and essentially say wow this is a really cool top water bait <laughs> and the patent which we'll have up here uh was uh issue or it was filed in 19 December 17th 1938 uh, the first advertising came out in the middle of 1939. Uh, we we're going to have some uh, advertisements from the, well, 1940. I think I've got about four advertisements from that year. And then I think I have 45 and 47 and some maybe some later ones, too, that we'll be dispersing throughout the show. Um, as soon as it hit the market, Ken, it, it was a, a success. Yeah. No other lure moves like a jitterbug no other lure at least especially at that time now we have some baits that are called typically called crawlers and uh like the crazy crawler well and the crazy car crazy crawler also came out about 1938 i think mm -hmm. but the crazy crawler has these arms on the side that that open up as it's coming through the water and cause it to walk the jitterbug does it strictly on the basis of the the face of the bait and and the other crawler lures you see a lot of big crawler baits coming out of japan uh they have the arms much like the head and crazy crawler but that that wobbling crawling gurgling action is, is something that was new to the bass market at that point would you consider it the first wake bait I would not because I think of a wake bait as as something that has a diving lip that although the bait doesn't dive below the surface, it uh, it or not far below the surface. I think a lot of wake wake baits do dive below the surface, but just an inch or two. Uh, I would not. Um, I put it in its own classification as a topwater lure though, and I call it a, a crawler. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm big on lure taxonomy I... <laughs> and Terry, of course, uh, the reason I can't work with Terry on lure taxonomy is because <laughs> he wants to judge things by, by length. And if it's a 16th of an inch too long, then he classifies it in a whole different category. And no, that, that's I, madness. That's madness. I, I actually, I, tell you. I actually think that if you're not going to consider it the first wake bait, it was the thing that, that brought about maybe the wake bait, uh, because what does it do on the surface? It makes a wake. There's, there's well, no disputing that. Azira Spook makes a wake if you throw it and wind it back. Oh my gosh, that's not the type of wake I'm talking about. Jeez. Oh, oh, now we're <laughs> now we're classifying wake. Damn right. <laughs> All God. wakes are different. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> anyway. Hey, hey, uh, a jerk bait or a twitch bait makes a wake if you crank it slow enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I so mean, that means that the Rapala the original fin. Rapala minnow, the red fin. That's a, I, I think that is a wake bait because you can't get that thing any deeper than to wake. Oh no, no. But <laughs> a Rapala floating minnow will wake on a slow enough retrieve, but True. you speed it up a little bit and it won't wake anymore. Right. So no, no, these are not. You're nah. you're you're way off here. Ah, nah. stop stop right going on. down that rabbit. Right on target. Anyway, 
So by the by the night by the end of the, the the first year that this bait was released, I mean, it was it was winning field and stream. I mean, it was catching some of the biggest fish that were being weighed in and in, in all these magazine contests and you know uh, local fishing contests put on by the hardware store. I mean, it was a, a revolutionary bait. Um, I mean, it was it, not only that; it was nearly idiot proof. You, all you had to do was cast the thing out and reel it in. That was it. Yeah, you, uh, and of course, the sweet spot was whenever you were making the most noise with the bait. The attitude generally was that's the right speed. Yep. Um, and and when Terry's talking about winning all these contests, of course, Field and Stream had a big fish contest that they ran from 1911 to 1977 or 78. And, and this wasn't just winning in the largemouth category, which is where most of us think about topwater lures generally, but especially a, a, the jitterbug. There were years when it was winning um, multiple smallmouth awards too. Yeah. Uh, in 1943, uh, four out of the top 10 smallmouth in the country were taken on a jitterbug. Yeah, yeah 14 of the, the, the 44 contest winners that year uh, were for smallmouth. I mean, that's that it's a it's a crazy you know thing that people really don't don't think of. So. Yeah, the jitterbug was a massive hit, a massive hit for Arbogast, and mm -hmm. uh, and well, jumping ahead a bit, it's a bait that we should all still have in our boxes. And we should all still be throwing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, the jitterbug shined at night. That's. Oh, no pun it, intended. <laughs> it really shined at night. It was the uh, full moon of the nighttime fishing. Uh, and it, it, even in those those early 1940 ads, uh, it said that. I mean, Fred Arbogast knew how to market. You just look at any old magazine from the, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and you were inundated with Arbogast ads. And in those ads, he specifically stated that this is the best night fishing bait made, period. And uh, it's pretty cool when you got an angler that, uh, or, that, or a bait maker that is actually an angler and knows how to market his baits. Yeah, you know, one of the first articles I ever read in Bassmaster Magazine when I joined, I was 14 years old or maybe 13. And uh, our, our friend, the late, great Stan Fagerstrom, wrote an article. I, I haven't looked at that article in a while, but I remember the title very well. He said it was called Jitterbuggin', It's Still in Style. Of course, he was referring to the dance from the right. 1920s and yeah. uh, a great lure. And by then, even, which was probably 76 or so, um, the jitterbug was considered old fashioned, but yeah. people are still catching record fish on the jitterbug, including the Rhode Island state record largemouth, which was taken in 2016. Yeah. I mean, that's a bait that, like you said a couple minutes ago, if you don't have one in your, in your box, you might be missing something because I know for a fact that not many bass have seen the thing, uh, especially in the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, and it, if you're throwing a crawler and you're getting bit on a crawler, you might want to try throwing a jitterbug because it's going to, provide a little bit different sound a little bit different action but it's the same type of concept you know and that that, that crawler the the head and crazy crawler was brought to market uh arbogast had the jitterbug so tightly patented nobody could copy it and that was Hedden's response to the jitterbug was the crazy crawler and i think it came out in 1940 uh might have been 41 uh, and that's why it was brought out. So, yeah. Um, but I mean, the 1960s, and we got some pictures from the 1960s and and the 1970s. But really, when I became infatuated and enthralled with the jitterbug, was through a series of articles that was written in Bassmaster magazine in 1980 about a gentleman by the name of L.J. Brasher from Opelika, Alabama. Opelika. Opelika, Opelika. You say tomato, oh, I say tomato. <laughs> how dare you mispronounce something yeah, from Alabama. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. But, um, the, Ken, I mean, you, you vividly remember those articles. 
Oh, oh yeah. Well, and of course, uh, these were not articles that were just in Bassmaster. A, a terrific outdoor writer named John Phillips was, uh, who's still out there and very prolific, was kind of spreading the gospel of this one angler who uh, would go out uh, and fish, especially in the Florida Panhandle, but also Southern Alabama, uh, yeah. Southern Georgia. And, and at night, he was throwing a, a big black musky jitterbug and, and racking up the giants. Yeah. And so uh, I think it's now time we should probably bring on our guest, uh, Mr. Jason Flesher, who is a uh, groupie slash... Uh... Groupie? <laughs> What's up, Jason? How are you yeah. doing? A groupie I am. A longtime <laughs> LJ Brasher fan. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. And Jason actually, you know, is friends with the Brasher family. And uh, you've got some really cool Brasher memorabilia that, that Ken and I fawn over. Um, yeah. can, can you tell us how you got... Uh, you know, what turned you on to L.J. Brasher? Uh, I remembered stumbling across one of the articles, and I couldn't tell you which one it was when I was a lot younger than I am now. And uh, that story just always stuck out in my head. And then yeah. as I got back into bass fishing when I got older and really started diving into the history of it, and uh, I just had to figure out, like, I wanted to find out more with what was out there on this guy, you know. And so mm -hmm. I did all the things that you guys do, just started digging and, you know, trying to, get down the rabbit hole and uh i found the outdoor life article from 79 and then uh the two uh bass master articles from 19 february january and february of 1980. Yep. Uh, i located those on ebay got those and i still just wanted more information so i crossed the line and started looking for people named brasher in the area and reaching out to them and just trying to find out more about the guy and uh so the first one that i met was his nephew nick which is uh uh lj's brother's son who who, uh -huh. who was also a, who was also a, a pretty great trophy fisherman himself he just didn't get the same credit that lj got uh, but uh nick later introduced me to his older brother lane and then lj's son landon so mm -hmm. and Lando and i are still really good friends to this day jason i've, I've known you less than an hour i'm already a huge fan i see so much of of you of me in you except obviously you're younger better looking uh because those kind of articles also inspired me i remember reading articles about lj brasher bill o'connor people yeah. like that and i just wanted to dive in and i wanted to know who those guys were and everything um tell us about your a i i understand you have a youtube page dedicated to big fish tell us about that uh well, the YouTube page, uh, I did a few interviews on there with guys. The YouTube page is not not really my big thing. I kind of moved away okay. from that. Uh, there was my another mistake. podcaster. There was another podcaster who started doing what it is. The only thing I wanted was to hear these trophy bass fishermen talk, and so I, I couldn't find a platform where that was happening. So I started one. That was yeah. that was the whole purpose behind that page. And so then it was around the same time that I discovered there was another guy out in California who was who was actually doing a podcast and having a lot of the big swim bait guys on and stuff. And I thought, well, that boy's been filled now. I don't have to do that anymore. And his his audio equipment was a lot better than mine. So I just thought, well, I'm just going to listen to his. And uh, so I did keep the Facebook page up and running and and sharing the big bass history photos and uh, video stories, whatever, to the Facebook page, and uh, that's double, that kind of double digit, double digit double. bass. If you're interested, uh, that's kind of where I, that's kind of where I go when I need to to get my history fix and and share things with other people. I think a lot of these guys get forgotten over the years, and I just like to to keep that at the forefront. You know, no question. And and I don't know if we mentioned it. Uh, if we did, it slipped uh, it slipped by me. But uh, L.J. Brasher, born in 1938, passed away in the late 90s. He didn't even make it to 60 years of age, unfortunately. Um, but a, a legendary name in in big bass chasing, and um, and a big part of his game was the bait we're talking about right Absolutely. now, which is the Arbogast jitterbug. And I should let Terry lead you into this question, but. But what role did the jitterbug play in Brasher's big bass game plan? It was it was absolutely huge in his big bass game plan. Uh, 
to the to the best of my knowledge, he he had to have been throwing it around sixty two as early as sixty two or sixty three. Uh, primarily fishing at night, uh, he would go against the full moon argument. He would say it was around a new moon, uh, no moon uh, out at night, complete pitch dark, and his claim was that if you gave him three nights around a new moon. Uh, he was going to catch a double-digit bass, and he actually brought Johnny Phillips on and proved that to him. So uh, <laughs> That I was think- one of the things that always amazed me about the Brasher stories was that guy would go out, and he would basically, maybe a slight exaggeration, not sleep for 72 hours, but just chunk and wind the I, whole time. I'm, I'm really not sure that's even an exaggeration, to be honest with you, Ken, wow. because – John Phillips did right that they had fished all night one night. The whole next day, when he would switch to daytime, he would throw live shiners up around lily pads, fish all day. And then as soon as the sun went down, right back to the jitterbug. And so he actually caught the double digit uh, when Johnny Phillips was with him, I believe, at around one o'clock in the morning on the second night with no rest. And and he caught it while Phillips was asleep in the bottom of the boat. <laughs> <Asleep>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I think John Philip referred to it as marathon angling when you were with LJ Brasher. Oh, and here's another thing that fascinates me. Uh is LJ those aren't just initials. That was the man's name, it seems. That was his actual name. It was it was actually on his birth certificate, according to his son, it was L dot J dot. Uh, I think LJ just did the LJ, you know, when he wrote it, but uh, that was actually his name on his birth certificate. That's not, that's not shortened. That's interesting. It's not unprecedented. I mean, Harry S. Truman, S is his middle name. Uh, yeah. So that, but that, that's, that's interesting to me. It's the first and middle, just LJ. I think that's kind of cool. But, and I asked you, I asked him, I said, well, why do you have, have any idea why they just named it? He said, I had, I never really even thought about it growing up. He said, I, you know, I never got a chance to ask his mother why she did that, but she she did say that his name was just LJ. So that's crazy. Uh, it's pretty wild. Uh, he also his son also told me a story that when he was drafted to the military, uh, he was in California and they took him to Fort Hood, Texas, and they were five minutes away from locking him up because he refused to give him a full name. He kept telling them, "My name is just LJ." And they didn't believe him, so he had to get in touch with his mom and have her send the birth certificate there to keep from being in trouble over not giving him a full name. That's that's <laughs> hilarious. It's hilarious until you're in the brig, oh, I guess. Gosh. But uh, that's that's amazing. Now, uh, Terry, I know you did some digging, and, and I don't know if, if Jason provided some of this information, but I was not aware about Mr. Brasher's uh, work that he did and, and things like that. But um, he 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 burned the candle at, at both ends. Yeah, he had a transmission shop. Uh, he was a mechanic, uh, and I guess owning the shop allows you uh, as much free time as you want as you get someone else doing the work for you. Um, <laughs> his biggest limit that that I was ever able to uncover was sixty two pounds. Um, so about five fish, or that's five fish, five fish. Um, and then, uh, his best year was, uh, 1977 with 80 fish over 10 pounds. Um, that's, that's unbelievable in the, not in the non-trout, non-swim bait days, you know, you talk, you look like Butch Brown and, you know, some of those guys slinging swim baits out there and, you know, that that's, uh, they can probably do that fishing the right lakes at the right time. Uh, but he's doing it with a jitterbug in in northern Florida where there's, you know, weeds and all so- sorts of stuff that you're going to have an opportunity to lose fish in uh, uh, as opposed to Castaic Lagoon or Castaic itself where there's nothing except rock. And, uh, yeah, he he did it all. Do you have anything to add to that, Jace? Um I, I actually have that in 1976, he, he had 89 bass over 10 pounds. So, okay. so that, that may have been his best year. Uh, that was actually written by John E. Phillips in one of the articles. Uh, I can't remember exactly which one, but I took that from one of his articles. Okay, cool. Uh, and then the 62-pound limit, and then he also, in August of 71, he had a five-fish limit on Lake Jackson that was 60 pounds, four ounces, all on a jitterbug at night. 
Jeez. <laughs> Jackson crazy. was such a lunker hole back in the 60s and early 70s uh, yeah. before it used to go dry every so often. It used to, a sinkhole would, would suck up all the water and it would go dry for a while. And finally, somebody with the state or the county decided that's bad for property values because when it went dry, people would plant crops, yeah. grass would pop up, and it would just be a boom again on, on big fish. But they, they started to fill it up with old wrecked cars and washing machines and stuff like that to try to prevent it from uh, going dry again. And it, it hasn't been the same since then, but it was a yeah. legendary place. What? Yeah, what? I, got, I, got, I got an overhead uh, picture of it that we'll, we'll put up around here. Wasn't there something said about the water actually going underground on that lake? It wasn't actually drying up, but it was going oh, underground. Yeah. And it, when it, it would come back, there would still be fish. Yeah, exactly. It would go. It would go dry in the sense that there was a sinkhole. There was a clear place where it was. All the water was was going in. I'm not sure how they explained. You know, Florida has sinkhole problems, and and I'm not sure how they necessarily explain what a sinkhole is doing. But I know that uh, a lot of it has to do with that aquifer. And when things get really relatively dry around here, that's when you worry, I think, primarily about sinkholes. Because yeah. that, that aquifer that's holding up all the sand and everything that is Florida, uh, when that goes away, something's got to give. Gotcha. But, and so the fish would just go down into the sinkhole. And then when the water would come back, they would come back. That's crazy. Yeah, because there was a story that one of his family members told me that he was down there fishing and somebody told him, like, the the lake was dry. The water's just now coming back. There's not going to be any fish in there. And he went out and caught a big limit that night. And even the even the uh, the, the wildlife didn't believe in there. Like, you didn't catch those here. And he was like, no, I, I caught them here. So he had to take one of them out the next night and show them that he was catching those fish out of Lake Jackson. Remember, Terry, we did the Florida smallmouth show on Walter Harden earlier this year, and oh, yeah. uh, there were people speculating that that the smallmouths were were being moved from the lakes they had been stocked in to other lakes they had not been stocked through this underground system. Well, yeah. there's still there's still people who who believe that, and uh, of course we know that wasn't true because there were no smallmouths in Florida. But uh, it's uh, we we live in paradise here, Jason. Florida is just paradise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I want to get into uh, how Brasher modified his bait. Um, he didn't use a stock uh, musky jitterbug. He, and, he did not. He, he and, found and, ways. And, yeah. Tell us the he, special oh, now. ways yeah. that he uh, he did this. Oh, he's well, got he a did. better one than you can. Oh, I know. He's <laughs> got the real deal. I've got a stock model right here. <laughs> he, he basically put longer brass screws in all the hardware uh, was one of the main mods that he did to him. He changed the hooks out. And I think he used Eagle Claw hooks. And then uh, he actually took the bill, if you can see right here, and pushed it further up on the nose of the bait. Yeah, well, I'll give folks a little something to look at here. And see. so according to LJ, that gave the bait a deeper tone, having the bill up on it like that. And... Uh, then he also took and moved the rear hook from the underneath side of the bait where they were originally at and actually moved it to the rear of the bait. Yep. Uh, and I'm sure that probably had something to do with the hookup ratio more than it did how the bait performed. Uh, mm -hmm. But he also curled the, the mouth of the bait. He would fold it in on both sides to make it eat water differently. Yep. And another thing that his son told me is that if he was going out before dark he would just take them and throw them in the water beside the boat he might have had them tied on i'm not sure but he would he would let them soak before he fished them because apparently on these wooden baits the water would get in the bait and it would make it set different in the water so if he was going out late at night and wanted to be able to catch immediately he would be soaking them in the bathtub before he would go out to go ahead and get that get that water in the wood and get that that swim that he wanted out of and he also replaced the original line tie with a split ring, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, can you tell yeah, us the provenance the... of that bait that you're holding? This is the bait that was given to me by LJ's son, Landel. And this hung in uh, LJ's, uh, his PB that was on his wall in his living room. This is the bait that it was caught on and it hung in that fish's mouth until a couple of years ago when Landel gifted it to me. 
Jason, I'll Damn. get you my mailing address. You can send that on down. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and looking at the modifications he made, um, a couple of them actually impressed me. You know, I see a lot of anglers and especially a lot of tournament anglers making modifications and you wonder, yeah, right. Yeah. This is just a fish, but, but I can see how manipulating the, the lip would change the pitch and the tone of the bait. And I've always thought this little line tie on the, uh, on the, uh, out of the box jitterbug was, was pretty sketchy. Um, <laughs> yeah. I always wondered how, if you hooked a really big fish on that, how in the world, um, yeah. now, like you said, maybe you get a better hookup ratio with that thing coming straight off the, the body there, but those modifications are, are fascinating. And, and the guy who threw, threw a, a single bait as often as Brasher threw a musky jitterbug, I'm, I'm much more likely to pay attention than, than just some guy who's throwing him in a derby once in a while. Well, he absolutely had it dialed in. There's no question about that. And I'm sure it took him years to, to come up with all those mods and perfect them. To me, it's amazing that he knew that he wanted a different tone than what it had from the factory. You know I mean? He in what in that man's mind said, Hey, I need to change that bill and get a slightly deeper. Like he, he had to have had a tone he was looking for and he was making adjustments and trying to find that tone. You know, I wonder if he threw his bait against a log or something and it bent it and it changed the tone and he's, he's winding it back in, you know, he gets it's bit very, and catches it's it's very possible, but I mean, even the fact that he moved it up on the nose to make the water to make it eat water differently, it's like, man, I you know, I I mod baits all the time. I probably never would have thought of moving the you know moving the bill further up on the nose to make it you know respond differently to what I was doing. You know, I mean, it's, and it absolutely it has a different tone because I've got one. I won't fish that one obviously, but uh, I've got one that another L.J. Brasher uh groupie made for me and uh he modified it as closely as he could to what he took from the magazines of lj's i took it out on one night trip last year and oddly enough lj said you're most likely to catch a 10 pound bass on one of these between 2 45 in the morning and 3 15 in the morning on a no moon so night really i didn't catch range. a 10 but i caught a I didn't catch a 10, but I caught a 714 on this just outside that window at 3.36 in the morning. Damn. So <laughs> It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Now, now uh, everybody talks about black at night, giving you a better silhouette and so forth. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, was that pretty much the only color he would throw at night? Uh, as to, to the best of my knowledge, it was always black at night. Yep. And, uh, uh uh, he was throwing it on braid. You know, what's amazing to me is this guy, you know, he, he passed away, unfortunately, about 25 years ago, but yeah. this man was throwing it on gear that, uh, that we have, we have kind of s uh, migrated toward the heavy braid, uh, mm -hmm. the heavy rod. He would have been uh, so much better to do it with what we have now, of course. Oh yeah. That, yeah. that, that, that Dacron braid that they had back in the, 60s 70s 80s and 90s sucked yeah it was horrible it was hollow it didn't pack it was a bitch to cast and and uh, i think that, i think the rod he was using was super short compared to anything we use these days you know he wouldn't have been you know he could have picked up a flipping stick or something like that uh in the yeah. seven beginning in the 70s and had something to go with it might have been a little better but yeah. uh, maybe he felt like with the braid he didn't need a really long rod what what blows me away Jason, and maybe you have some insight into this. What blows me away was he's coming down in the Florida panhandle, deep South Alabama and Georgia, and, and he's throwing this thing at night in waters that have a lot of alligators. And I was, I was talking to Terry about this earlier today. I was saying, man, I realize that there are more alligators now. They've been more protected now than they were back in, in maybe some of his peak years of the 60s and 70s. Yeah. But still, how do you how do you not spend the entire evening trying to wrestle it away from alligators? Well, I don't know if you guys are aware of it. I'm sure you are. Uh, he also fished what they called potholes around that area, which was basically divots in the earth created by hurricanes or tornadoes moving water, and it would make divots, and he would go out and fish those. And one of his requirements for 
will I fish this? Well, will I waste my time fishing this? It had to have an alligator. It had to have one. Yeah. Because he said that signified to him that it had been a few years since that pond had dried up, which would give it the ability to hold bigger fish. Uh, well, today you can hardly find a, a lake or Gutter. pond of any size of any size that doesn't have an alligator or two in it. And they are very territorial. And uh, during the brood, uh, breeding season, they, they migrate. And so suddenly you got a new alligator this year in that pond, but, but they're everywhere. Yeah. And, and you, you run something like a musky jitterbug through a, a body of water that's got an alligator. That's like saying, <laughs> come here right now. <laughs> yeah. I would spend all my time. Well, first of all, I could not afford enough musky jitterbugs to get me through a season of fishing, but I'm, I'm I'm impressed that he was able to to keep those things off his line. I don't know how many he lost to alligators. I know he spent if he fished around an alligator once, he spent more time doing it than I'm trying to. You know what I mean? So yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but he you know, seems to not. He he wasn't. Um, not only was he not worried about them, like he when he would fish those potholes, it was a requirement. It has to have. I just thought that was crazy when I read it. And you know how many he lost to alligators? It's not because they're breaking the line, because it's rare for an alligator to break your line, especially with braid. That braid's going to go between the teeth. And in five minutes, you'll have that alligator boat side. I don't care if he's nine feet. In five minutes, you'll have him boat side, maybe 10. Um, but then you got a bigger problem. Yeah. Um, Reaching your hand in to get it out. <laughs> yeah. Because unless he opens his mouth and that thing just mir miraculously pops out. You've just lost a jitterbug. And these, even then, these things were not cheap. But I love the style of fishing that Brasher did. I love how dialed in he was on that bait. Um, that impresses me no end. It makes me want to fish at night in Florida, which is something, honestly, that very, very few people do. Not just because of the alligators, but because of the mosquitoes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, enough to breed a turkey standing flat footed. Oh, I don't. I don't really. From what I know about L.J. Brasher, just not only as an angler but as a person, if he got in his mind that he was doing something, there just wasn't a whole lot that was going to stop him from doing it. You know, I mean, uh, his uh, his fishing partner, who I haven't had the opportunity to talk with yet, uh, Ricky Barnett, fished with him a lot, and uh, he's conveyed some some stories to me about L.J. through Landel. Uh, he said that he would be bundled up in long sleeve shirt, pants, boots, you know, everything tucked in. And he would still get these bites from these bugs that would just, you know, tear him up. And he said, LJ would be out there in a t-shirt. He didn't care. T-shirt and barefoot. He was going fishing. <laughs> did yeah. his, did Brasher's uh, perseverance, did his uh, stamina to be able to stay out there for 72 hours, was that purely born from fishing or did he get that? In the military, did he get that through marathon transmission repair sessions? Where did that come from? <laughs> I'm really not sure, to be honest. But uh, it just seemed, uh, from the few stories that I've heard from his personal life, it it definitely applied off the water as, as much as it did on the water. He was just a hardcore guy. <laughs> he, he looked it, you know. He looked like this big, burly guy who, if you were ever dropped in the middle of a really bad place, you would want him with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah absolutely and his boat i mean you look at that boat i mean it was like a 12 foot maybe 14 foot flat bottom john boat beam was maybe 40 inches you know wide i mean it was a it was a small boat and i guess that was to help him get into them small waters and be able to fish where the heck he wanted yeah and it served as a tornado shelter a couple of times too from what i'm told <laughs> Not a very good shelter. Pretty sure that's not that's not what uh, that's not what the Weather Channel would recommend. Uh, <laughs> so so here's a, a another thing, and and one of the reasons that you know that we call the jitterbug the the best trophy bass bait. Getting back to the subject of the show uh, that's ever been made is you know you had that 1939 through let's just say 1970 time frame you know of everybody fishing this bait and catching big fish on it lj starts in the in the 60s and he's got you know i've i've seen two two different numbers thrown around 500 and a thousand largemouth bass over 10 pounds um 
and both of those were written by John Phillips. Um, when you talked to Phillips, were you able to finagle out of him what number is right? Or uh, if I they... if I recall, Phillips did tell me that it was over a thousand, and he actually looked at LJ's logbook at some point because he took a section of LJ's logbook from May sixth to August fourteenth of nineteen seventy eight and copied his logs into one of those magazine articles. Yeah, it's in the February um, article or one of the February articles of uh, nineteen eighty. And and just during that time period, from May 6th to August 14th, uh, I count them. He logged no less than 31 double digits, uh, with the Jeez. biggest being four. With the biggest being 14 four. Damn. Oof. Was now you mentioned earlier, Jason, about the time of the evening. I think it was such a narrow gap too, like 2:45 to 3:30 two, two or something. 245 to 315. It was a half That's hour window. A half hour. My God. How about time of year? Was there a preference for him as to when he, he said, okay, I definitely got to go as many times as possible in the month of. I think, like I think, I think one of the articles made some kind of statement about he fished hardcore from March to September or something like that, which is strange because most trophy hunters fish the exact opposite months of that, you know, but I guess yeah. for the, for the places he was fishing and the type of fishing that he was doing, that would have best suited what he was doing. In one of the articles, it, it stated, or he stated, that he used that November through February time frame to go down and recon new places, to go into Absolutely. tackles, to go into tackle stores and look to see if they got big fish hanging on the wall. If they do, they're going to ask. You know, he's going to ask where did the fish come from and you know, all yeah. this other crap. So he spent a lot of, he spent like four or five months a year just doing recce, you know, deals. That was, that was when he went on scout trips, going out and finding bodies of water and making sure they have a gator so he knows whether he's going to come back there and fish or not. <laughs> well, I can actually shed a little light on this uh, because actually that November to through February period was when he would get some sleep because the man was up for 72 straight hours chasing these fish. <laughs> uh, you know, if John Phillips wrote in 1980 that he was somewhere upwards of a thousand, he said that he said that LJ was 17 years into trophy hunting bass at that time. So if you think about from the time that was written, it was another 17 years before LJ passed away. I just I'm very curious as to what that number landed at, you know? Yeah. What can you tell us about Brasher's life after the Phillips stories kind of? I really Stop. don't know. I, I do know that he continued to fish. Uh, I do know that he also loved to hunt. I don't know how much time he dedicated to hunting, but uh, I do know that he loved to hunt. He actually passed away on a hunting trip in Colorado. Ah, so wow. uh, I do know that he did spend some time hunting and he did continue fishing. I've tried to, to get uh, his son to locate that log book. He still believes it's in the family oh. somewhere. It's probably in a storage unit. Uh, but he yeah. can't put his hands on it. I would love to put my eyes on that old book and see what the final numbers were. Wow. I hope the family gives it to you because you're a guy who would appreciate it and take good care of it and, and find a way to share aspects of it. So yeah. I hope they have the, uh, the good sense to, to let you have it. And, and then, and then if you don't want it, I'll take it. <laughs> oh, there's always a, there's always a twist jason <laughs> jason you, you made a horrible mistake by agreeing to do the big bass podcast and now you're paying for that mistake so well let me ask you this uh was was brasher of the uh the opinion that 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 retrieve which kind of generates the most noise is the go-to did he did he just zero in on that monotony or I really think so. Yeah, from everything that I've been told, it was just that it was that once he got it modified, there was just that one tone, and he just he just kept it at that. And, and in my experience, the one night I've been out night fishing, and a few early mornings, late evenings, throwing this bait, that's what that's what gets me. But it's just that it's just a very constant, low, slow tone, and they absolutely they don't play around with it. When they hit it, it's I mean it's an explosion when they hit. It. Wow. You just went where I wanted to go in, in talking with you about this, Jason. I was going to ask, and apparently the answer is you haven't had a chance to do a lot of it. But since you are fascinated by a lot of these big bass chasers, uh, have you spent much time throwing the black musky jitterbug at night? This, this one was given to me last year. I took it out one time. 
and I threw it at night, and then I've thrown it early morning and late evening a few times and caught good fish on it. I haven't caught a double digit on this yet, but I can definitely see where it would, I mean, I, it's just got a tone to it like no other bait I've ever heard with that modification on it. And have when you're you throwing tried? it, it you, you kind of got this thing in the back of your mind when you're throwing it, like, it could happen anytime. It's exciting. Have you tried to <laughs> modify a, a boring one like I have and, and get it? get a create a bra called a brasher bug is that what he called it yeah i actually didn't modify this one uh, a fellow lj brasher fan who still fishes these he's got about 40 or 45 of them that he's bought and modified and he still fishes at night regularly sometimes on the same lakes that lj used to fish uh his name is jimmy zinker he actually made this one for me so this is the brasher bug and i call this one the zinker bug because he modified it to be as close as he could get it to the to the brasher bug and uh he's been fishing that style since the 80s and he's caught a lot of big fish doing it that's fantastic oh yeah. that's right i gotta load up with thermocells and mosquito netting <laughs> and get out there I, no I really i really agree with y'all's statement early on in the show i think <laughs> guys who won't, don't have one of these in the tackle box i think they're really oh. missing something there there yeah. really there's no question it's just you know the jitterbug has been quiet no pun intended for maybe the last 30 or 40 years yep. but yep. there's no good reason for that just no yep. good reason for that well but then look at the crazy crawler craze that has you know come around in the last four or five years yep. nobody threw a crazy crawler from heck the 80s until five years ago you know maybe it's time to get the jitterbug back out and Unfortunately, you're going to pay a hell of a lot of money for because he'd only use the wooden ones. Absolutely, yeah, LG, yeah, he would not use the plastic ones. They're expensive. I mean, you can <laughs> find them on eBay, but uh, they're they're costly. I mean, uh, you're gonna you're probably going to spend forty, fifty, sixty bucks on one of them. You're yep. going to spend more than that after this show comes out, and you're <laughs> most likely going to have to paint it black because you know it's. You're going to run into frog ones. You're going to run into yellow ones and white with red head ones. And yeah, yeah, it's uh, you're going to have to mod it a little bit. And then you're going to have to do the, the brasher mods to it, too. So absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it definitely makes a different tone. And uh, I, w I wish I had a video with some audio where you guys could hear it. It's definitely different. I mean, uh, like I said, I've only been out with it a couple of times. I've thrown it early morning, late evening. Uh, but I don't think I've been out with it a single time in low light conditions where I didn't have a fish at least take a stab at it. Wow. That's impressive. Terry, we're fishing Bienville next summer at night with jitterbugs. Did you know that? You and me? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> well, you guys get you a wooden one and get in touch with my buddy Jimmy Zinker and have him mod it for you if you're not confident in doing it because he's gotten pretty good at it over the years. He's been doing it for a long time. Uh, we're, well, you'll be on speed dial, Jason. <laughs> okay, we're going to need your buddy Jimmy to modify these. I've got three of them. We're going to need him to you modify got three these. I got three of these. I'm sorry, did I say I have three? I have the only one. I have only this. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, a, that, 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 that's that 1989 redo with the cedar and the whole nine yards. So that's yeah, probably yeah. off the same old, uh, you know, duplicator and all that crap. So it's cedar. We know it's cedar. Is that right? Yeah, it's cedar. Okay. Uh, yeah. no, I, I've got three. <sighs> um, I shouldn't have said that, but I got three. Um, no, we're going to get your buddy Jimmy to modify them. And then, Jason, we're going to ask you to, to bless them somehow so that we <laughs> will be almost guaranteed double-digit fish. And then we so, can join your, your, you know, your, your double-digit bass club. Yeah. So I got another question for you, Jason. Okay. All the fish, and we're going to put the picture of, uh, of LJ's wall up right about now. What happened to all those fish? I mean, he must have had 100 mounts all over 10 pounds in his house. He had them in his house, and then one of the walls in that house, all the walls that were available, maybe maybe that his wife would let him have in the house. I'm not sure what the situation was, but from what I've been told, a little, uh, the overrun wound up on the wall down at the transmission shop at one point. So, wow. Uh, and where are they today? Uh, his son told me that they got dispersed amongst family members after LJ passed. His son still has his PB on the wall in his living room. He sent me a picture of it earlier today. And show me that it's still hanging there. That's uh, awesome. 
And can we get a pic? Can we get that picture so we can put yeah. it on the show? Yeah, awesome. yeah I'll send it to you. Uh, but uh, the the Jackson Five, which is re- what they refer to that, I think it was the sixty pound four ounce five fish limit that he caught on Jackson on the jitterbug. Those were mounted on a piece of circular wood that looked like a big wooden saw blade, and all five fish were on it with a you know old chain stringer in their mouth. Uh, I'm not sure if that was the 64, the 60 dash four limit, but it was a big limit of fish from Jackson because they're referred to as the Jackson five. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I think, that, I think LJ's wife still has that one. I think, uh, even now. So. Wow. That's crazy. She's, yeah. She's and I actually still... got a newspaper print of that, that I'll put up yeah. uh, for everybody to check out. Yeah. Uh, awesome. That's cool. Such well, cool stuff. I mean, I mean, you, you've you've got you know brashers fish that are probably well over a thousand double digits, and then all the fish that everybody else caught, you know, from thirty nine to whenever you know brashers started, and even past when brashers started, people were still hey, catching big fish on it. Those guys doing it now. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, I don't think you can argue. I mean, the, the whole swim bait genre has only been around, well, it's been around since the mid 80s, uh, but it really hasn't taken off. And, and even with a swim bait, it, there's way more than one model and size and, and all that. When you're talking one specific bait by one company, one bait. I yeah. don't think anybody can argue that the jitterbug is the number one big bass producer ever made uh, what, I, what do you I think won't, i won't disagree i won't disagree with that uh i think a lot of people would say it was probably the huddleston but look at how long that the, the jitterbug has been around before the huddleston came out i can't imagine that it's caught as many big fish no. as, as the jitterbug has exactly uh, and i also would like to say that i i throw big swim baits that's what i throw 99.9 percent of the time Mm-hmm. And LJ Brasher wasn't a swim baiter per se, but I do give him credit as being an early big baiter because he had he had that mindset already. Yeah. Of kind of the swim baiter. Well, Those just weren't was, available at the time. He was know? throwing one of the biggest baits that was available. Yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, folks can see, get an idea how big that 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 bait is. I mean, here's a pretty conventional sized pen next to it and it's almost as long as the pen that's what four uh, and three quarter inches long if i remember right four and three quarter. Oh, yeah 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 it's a, weighs I mean, over weighs, an ounce right yeah i think it weighs two ounces or more i don't have a scale right here with me but it's a, it's a hefty bait it's not you know super aerodynamic but uh you can throw it a long way um and and I'm going to put you on the spot, Jason. I'm going to ask you a, a little trivia question I asked Terry before the show, but now he knows the answer. So I went through as many of the old field and stream fishing contest winners as I have, which is most of them, but not all of them. And and it's pretty clear to me that the Arbogast Jitterbug was producing more winning fish than any other bait mm-hmm. by a fair margin. What would you think was number two, an individual bait? And by the way, live you know live bait did very very well. <laughs> probably so something like a live <laughs> shiner sure. is probably number one. But you know we're we're ignoring them. We're going strictly artificials. What do you think was what do you think was you know right there in the hunt? I don't know. Going back that far, I really I I don't know. I, yeah, it I only ran even... from from 1911 to the late 70s. But it was the Johnson Silver Minnow. Which makes a, a ton of sense, of course, because a bait that was there in almost the beginning and a bait that that yeah. lasted longer almost than the contest. But that's a bait well, that I still throw available. Out. Yeah, it's still available. It's still a great, great lure, underrated lure. Um, yeah. But it's very cool to see uh, see where the jitterbug stands. All right, now if I, if you had to pick, Jason, just one lure to be named the best big bass record bass type lure of all time what would you pick i'm gonna say it's probably the musky jitterbug i, I really would yeah. yep. thank I you really would. good good oh you're making us look good man 
<laughs> if you if you just said have a sh- bunch of swim bait guys pissed off at us. <laughs> yeah, well, they're they're gonna be pretty pissed off at me too. But I mean, you got to think about how long that bait's been around and how many years guys were doing work with it. If LJ Brasher put a thousand on it, and I know there were other guys in the area who were ch- hunting trophy fish with that bait. I've heard that there were other guys in the area doing that. So yeah, I think your um, your buddy Zickers caught a couple hundred or t- three hundred over ten, right? I don't know how many he's got over 10, but he's caught more seven to nine pound fish on that bait than probably. I don't know anybody else throwing swim baits that's got any more of those class fish on the jitter bug than he does on, I mean, on a swim bait than he does on that jitter bug. I really don't. I mean, wow. he goes out three or four nights a week and he's constantly posting seven to nine pound fish on Jeez. that bait. That's. Yeah outrageous that's crazy and the count keeps climbing <laughs> now, jason we're gonna let you go here in a minute but um I-, I bet another name you're familiar with uh since you're such an aficionado of the the big bass chasers is pat cullen um yeah, yeah and, and pat cullen did some very similar stuff you know but instead of a, a musky jitterbug he went out at night and threw these these homemade buzz baits. I shouldn't call them homemade. He Water sold lure. Them. Yeah, but but he no, he sold these baits. He made himself. Uh, uh, they they were actually made by Captain Burt Diener, but they uh, were designed. There you go. They were they were designed by Pat Cullen with Burt. Yeah, Diener. Uh, Burt Diener may be one of the biggest fishing addicts I've ever known. Burt Burt's one of those guys who you go out fishing all day. Maybe you'll come in for lunch. Burt's out on the dock with an ultralight throwing for bluegill well everybody else got a sandwich in their hand that's how that's how bad bert's got it uh wonderful human being one of my favorite people uh but super yeah Cullen, nice super nice guy he's a biologist in the state of georgia by the way fisheries biologist um but cullen was doing something very similar he also claimed uh over a thousand ten pounders mm-hmm. and if you can track it down he made a dvd on his methods and techniques he yeah. had like yeah, he had like three or five different buzz bait styles that he used. It was it was four of them. Yeah, four of them. And uh, he had originally started using I don't remember what brand they were, Lunker Hunt or something buzz baits for years, and he was just modifying them the, the four different ways himself and getting as close as he could. And then I think when he met Bert Diener, uh, they threw the idea around that they were going to design some baits, and they went to Bert's house and stood out by the swimming pool, and in one night he said that pat just would tell him do this do that he'd do it he'd throw it he'd say no you gotta bend it a little bit more that's not the sound i'm looking for so he knew the four four specific sounds that he was looking for and yeah they dialed in in a night so bert makes jigs bert's bert's jigs bert's custom jigs they're some of the finest things you'd ever want to throw and he's a super super talented guy um i don't know dr batisti Good stuff makes me want. To, I, I want to go yeah. out now. I'm yeah. gonna, when the show ends, I'm hitching <laughs> it up. It, it, it's a good idea, Ken. It's night right now, so you can it go. Is. exactly. <laughs> What's the it moon? Is. What's the moon? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> oh, we're it's it's like a first quarter. Yeah. So hey, is it waxing or waning? I, wax I, on, I, wax off. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I don't wax the moon. I don't wax my truck either. So. <laughs> I don't know that stuff, man. I go fishing when oh, I can. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Don't like, don't like John Alden Knight to you or Rick Taylor. No, you're not. John Alden Knight. That was a good book. I like that book. Absolutely. Anywho. Cool. All right, Jason, you've made well, a study of this jitterbug thing. If you had to give somebody some advice, on on throwing a jitterbug stuff we haven't covered maybe yet what would you want to tell them just keep throwing it keep throwing it you're not going to get a lot of bites on that bait but when you get bites they're going to be the the bite you're looking for that's just like a swim bait right i mean it is exactly the same mentality you go out with a swim bait or a rod or a deck full of swim bait rods yeah and you're happy if you get bit right you can do yep. the same thing with that damn jitterbug. That's so. it. And it, it it takes a pretty convincing conventional bait to pull me away from throwing swim baits, but I will throw that musky jitterbug in the right situations, right times, right situations, because I have seen what it's capable of. The night I caught the 714, we started two hours before dark. I was throwing it in, trying to get a feel for it. It's the first time I've been out with it. I mm-hmm. caught 
a fish that was about two pounds on it right as the sun was going down and i didn't get another bite until 3 36 in the morning but she was seven pounds 14 ounces so i just you just keep throwing it if you yep. keep throwing it you will get bit that's cool what pounds like that's you advice. throwing what kind of line are you throwing it on i throw mine on 65 pound braid okay yeah why not why not yeah well, a 65-pound braid is way smaller diameter than that 50-pound Dacron that they were throwing back when exactly. Brasher was doing it. Yeah. So, heck yeah. Yeah. And what kind of rod? Swim bait rod? Or? Yeah, I was throwing mine on a light swim bait rod. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. I like it. Sweet. Jason, thanks so much, sir. We appreciate you. Yep. Thank you for having me on, and I, I, I'm a big fan of the show and appreciate what you guys do to keep Big Bass history alive, man. Hey, oh. well, we appreciate what you're doing with uh, Thank you Double that. Digit Bass on Facebook. Uh, everybody, you got to go check out his page on Facebook. It's uh, it's awesome. So. I'm going to check it out, and I don't even do Facebook, but I'm going to check it out. <laughs> you got to. <laughs> I never even Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate yep. you. Yep. <laughs> Doctor, I think, you know, we haven't talked about this, but I think one of the big advantages of the jitterbug is it, it's traditionally thought of as a nighttime lure, whether that's yeah. fair or not. Yep. And, you know, darkness solves so many problems for an angler, you know? Oh, yeah. You don't have to be as pinpoint accurate on the cast, you know? Yeah, yeah it's just chunk and wine, chunk and wine. You can get away with 65 pound braid or 80 pound braid if you wanted to, or a hundred pound braid, if that made a difference, but it really wouldn't. Yep. I mean, my God, anything over 50 is probably more than you really need, but yeah. the opportunity to use heavy line to get out there. Um, if you can just keep it away from the alligators and alligators, not a problem And out of the trees or the bushes, right? Yeah. And this is not a Southern thing. We've talked a lot about fishing it in the South, but. The oh. most recent state record caught on a on a jitterbug was in Rhode Island in 2016. In 2016, exactly. Um, there exactly. have been former state records caught in in places like Ohio, um, where it originated. Yeah, where it originated in Akron. Um, <laughs> yep. The current state records uh, in in state there are four current state records that came on the jitterbug, and they're in mm -hmm. Connecticut. New Hampshire, Ohio, and as we've mentioned, Rhode Island. So yeah. the Arbogast Jitterbug, and there's no other lure that has four state records. No. Other than maybe a, a plastic worm. Well, yeah, but, but, uh, I mean, but I mean I mean the brand and everything. Exactly. Nothing. Nothing. This thing this thing is a spectacular, spectacular big bass lure. Born in nineteen thirty eight. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's almost a hundred years old. <laughs> and I know you might differ from me on this, but if somebody told me, Hey, you got to catch a 10 pounder, uh, in order to, uh, stay alive, uh, I would throw this at night all night. That would be the only bait that I threw at night. Well, I, I wouldn't even, if, if I know I can only fish for, let's say eight hours, I'd pick the nighttime hours and I'd throw this and I wouldn't stop. Yeah. I would not pick up another bait. I would choose after dark rather than daylight, unless maybe there's some bedding fish that are giants. All right. <laughs> That'd be about it. No, I, I can't disagree with you. I mean, if it was, if I was given eight hours during the day, I'd throw a swim bait. If I was given eight hours at night, then it would be the jitterbug without a doubt. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. Where are we, brother? I think we're about ready to wrap this up. You know, the uh, slam the door on uh, this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we know your time is valuable and we really appreciate you spending it with us uh, every week or two. Um, if you enjoyed the show, please hit the like, subscribe buttons, and if you, you know, it's a big favor for us. Uh, and please recommend the show to at least one friend. Uh, you do that and we double our audience instantly. Um, and if you're a Big Bass junkie, please check out the Big Bass Podcast uh, website at thebigbasspodcast.com. You'll find the Big Bass Podcast calculator, good for bass over 14 and a half pounds. And we have lists of the state record largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass. Um, and if you want to like to contact us, to uh, you know just uh, give us a con or a, 
an idea for content or just say, hey, uh, you can read us, reach us by email at Ken at the Big Bass Podcast dot com, Terry at the Big Bass Podcast dot com and Nathan at the Big Bass Podcast dot com. Please join us again soon and we'll bring you another story about another big bass that you will will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember this. Size matters. <laughs>